Hi, so this is my paper, Inhabited by Text and Space, A Body Without Some Organs. Um, my work is quite fictocritical and has a mixture of theory and creativity, so um, when there's references I don't say that this is a reference. Uh, you'll hear maybe a difference in my tone, but if you're interested in getting the references and you'd like to know which quotes I'm using, just send me an email and I'll send you a copy of the paper. Before surgery, I had a mantra. Poetry will be found here. I was taken up with theory and text, with the way words slip streamed around and through matter. I was searching for a way to describe this body outside of binaries and away from essentialism. I remain convinced that reductionism is not the way. I am not trying to siphon mind into body or to privilege the one over the other. Simply flipping things over is not an answer. There are hundreds of years of philosophical thought here. Plato's body as prison for the soul, Aristotle's Cora, mother, vessel, without shape or contribution, able only to carry. Descartes talked about two kinds of substance, mind and body, or res cogitans and res extenda. Mind first, of course, we must tame the flesh at all costs. When I read these, I was taken and wondered if a combination of the two would make sense of what it is that I am trying to do. But extenda cogitans is still two things linked, is binary with a feeble bridge, and I'm suspicious too of my instant falling for Latin, as if that originary white tongue adds some magisterial weight. It's not that I want to privilege body over mind, it's that by placing it first, I am trying to bring something else to light. When I say that this body speaks, I am using the word body as a sign, some way of saying matter and more than matter at exactly the same time. I'm using the word body as an encompassing thing, something that contains and simultaneously expels, that makes room for anarchy, for leavings and ruptures, for something other than constructions. When I read that bodies have all the explanatory powers of minds, I don't read mind as expelled from the flesh. I read matter and substance, the corporeal sewn through with semiotics, with text. I read something greater than the sum of its parts, some shining thing that is never whole. Spinoza's monism will not work for me. That is always exchanging fluid like love, like poetry, that leaves cellular stories in its wake, that makes some organic trail upon the earth, that gathers in and reels out, that dreams and makes new and sticks sinks into stench only to turn luminescent in some dark corner to dredge itself back up again. I am using the word body as a marker, some way of holding space, of speaking all of the stories that we fold into the creases of our fingertips, that soft place behind our ears, underneath the fascia, in the places where fluid shushes between organs. And no place is inside and nor is it out. It is, like Groz says, Lacan's Mobius strip, that furling chiral thing that shows the passage, vector or uncontrollable drift of the inside into the outside and the outside in to the inside. Poetry will be found here. When surgical instruments, all stealing glint, enter and cut and push and then pull parts of me out, I am all of a sudden that Mobius strip. I am theory, embodied, I am textual, drift. But only later, now, writing this. Then, in those first hours after waking, changed, wombless, in a morphine haze, all I could hope for was an absence of pain and the feel of a loved one's hand upon my cheek. Attached to the bed, a metal triangle hanging above me that I could grip with the hand that wasn't impaled by a cannula and then lift myself briefly and turn. On turning, catheter and drain and drip would pull and drag and my abdomen and thighs would clutch and soon I would turn back. Pressure against all of me, back, legs, shoulders, arms, a stinging itch over me. At some point I worked out that the itch was morphine and stopped pushing the button. Goodbye, warm feeling. Pain is instructive. Pain is instructive. 
It tells me when to stop. It teaches me the edges of things. It makes sense of the world I am in. Hospitals are not places to get well in. They are rosters and order, a constant battle against staff, tubes and alarms, a misguided dream where the body is a thing where no flesh speaks. If my flesh could speak, my flesh can speak. It would say this, after I have been sliced and had ports inserted and removed, after you have taken the core of me, while everything is learning its new place, let me wake in an egg-shaped room. Let me wake into the lightest of oranges and yellows with softness underneath me, so light I can barely feel it. Marigold, egg white, lemon peel. Let the only sound be the sound of leaves and then chimes so quiet and deep, they are a caress. Let the light be gentling sun and in the night folding darkness. Let stars guide my way. Let voices around me be hushed, holding words that topple from tongues to caress and then fade. Let me drink the cleanest, coolest water from the highest mountain streams. Feed me pulses and root vegetables shaded with cumin and turmeric, cooked so long they fall apart at the touch of a spoon. Let me smell eucalypts and then cinnamon. Minister to me when I am awake. When I am sleeping, let me sleep. I am going back to where I have been. I am retrieving. I am reassembling because I was taken apart on the operating table and the work of healing is mine. Trust me. Leave me a moat of quiet and gentling and warmth to swim back, to re-emerge, to begin. While my flesh dreamed of softness, of being held lightly and then left to heal, the morphine pump monstered me from the side of the bed. Press me, it said, and in that moment I did. Somewhere after the warfarin and well before dawn, the nurses at their station talking as loudly as if it were lunchtime, morphine itching its way along nerve endings, this. Morphine poems are bright, jittering things. Glimmer, glitter in the night, gut red, slickly bright. They follow the judder of the building and scribe earthquakes, dust, that shaking moment where everything is turned to nothing, brightly with chaos. Morphine poems have castles in them, shards of quartz that fly. They are beaming moments, they follow lines of flight, they make me feel brilliant and shimmery in the night. There is a moment drowning in a nest of hospital cotton, the pump dinging, the prongs that shoot oxygen into my nostrils, pain, webbing drug. There is a moment when I am streaming into light and quartz castle, the earthquake all around. There is a moment where I am no ordinary poet and the stitches in my belly, the hole where my uterus used to be, are the proof. No ordinary poet, mean. Morphine dream stream shining, fire bright gold shooting out, doubling in. There is a moment when it is all worth this moment here, this morphine dream. The moment when it is all worth it, when morphine scribes glory in the air, passes back into rucking sheet and nurses talking and tubes and a bag of blood hanging from my abdomen and I do not press the button again. The catheter bag fills and is emptied by a passing nurse with a jug. I am all fluid. I am a leaking bag of skin. The catheter. It traces my urethra. Taped to my thigh, it is stinging, warm, yellow, traced with blood. There are special hooks on the side of my bed to hold the bag. I am pinned. Tubes, bubbles, blood. When my urethra, when I move, my urethra cramps and the tube tugs at the place where inside becomes outside. When I move, the whole of my middle searches pain field for its core and finds only ache and the fear of movement. If I stay too long, in one place there is a different ache, the ache of pressure, of remaining static, hip and thigh ask for air, for relief, and so I balance one thing against the other and find that whatever I do, it will hurt. Pain is instructive, I repeat. Pain is instructive. I seek solace in counting backwards, slowly, from 100. Each number accompanied by breath. I can't hold my place, though. 
numbers slipping from under me, circling above me. It is not a number that is slipping. It is me. The bed shakes. I think there must be a tunnel running underneath the building with trains or mining machines shoveling through it because it is not just the bed. The whole building shakes. A nurse comes past in her quiet shoes and takes my blood pressure and checks my pulse and I ask her about the shaking. There is a furrow on her brow. She smooths it out again. No, there are no tunnels underneath the building. Can you tell me your name? I do. I repeat my name as the building shim tremors and the sheet rucks and the pressure presses. And I know she thinks I'm hallucinating, but there is nothing more real than this. The whole of everything that is outside of me shivering. This quantum moment, I am fixed. It is you who is not. My name is a mantra that ensures my place you have asked the wrong question. Ask yourself, what is my name? Where am I? What is this trembling moment? Ask yourself, am I stable or unfixed? Who is shaking? I start to suspect that these holes, the five stitched slices in my abdomen, the place from which the drain tube sprouts, the vaginal vault that has lost its cervix and gained a blunt end that right now is still seeping, and gape, the place in the back of my hand that opens to let in saline and morphine, and the tunneling catheter snaking along the inside of my thigh have so disrupted the I that is me and its place in the world that things are coming undone. If skin is the literal and metaphorical borderland between the materiality of the autobiographical I and the contextual surround of the world, and that skin, that surface, is pierced or cut or looped through with tubing that lets fluid in and out, then the borderland has been crossed, crisscrossed. The borderland is no longer border. It is rupture and split. It is simultaneously inside and out. It is Mobius Strip. What subjectivity? There is nothing to stop me becoming the world or the world becoming me and the nurse. The nurse's mother, archetype, storybook, shaken exterior. The nurse is me. It is finally morning. Morphine haze gone, I am all pain and ache and stinging awareness of the places that have been cut, of the ways that my body is now outside of itself. Now there is a different nurse. She is tall and thick with a loud voice. She whisks the curtain across and says she is going to reassemble me. These are not her words, of course, but this is what I think she means. No plastic pathways that attach me to bags of fluid. She will contain me again. First, the drain. Scalpel she store, saws at the stitch that holds it in place. A sharp, nerving sting looks closer. I grimace. I see, she says. The stitch is meant to stay. Scalpel away. Tube pulled from my abdomen. Bag of blood gone. Then on to the catheter. Deep breath, she says, then pulls. There is a popping feeling as the bulb filled with air that floated inside my bladder is wrenched through the opening. I am spread and she puts a fresh pad between my legs to catch the last blood I think I will bleed. Relief. Tube's gone. I am restored. I have a sense of knowing where my edges are, of being able to keep myself in. There is no mirror near the bed. I have not seen myself. With the catheter gone, I am suddenly free. I stand. No, I roll carefully to my side. I pull myself up with help because the whole of my middle is screaming. I swing my body around until my legs in their compression stockings are hanging over the side of the bed and my feet have made themselves ready to take my weight. I hold onto my drip pole. There are still tubes I have not been entirely reeled back in. And then I stand. I shuffle into the bathroom where there is a mirror. I avert my eyes. I will not see myself reflected there. Lacan's gestalt, my gestalt, has suffered multiple ruptures. The disturbance is too great. The ego is split between two extremes, a psychical interior which requires continual stabilisation and a corporeal exterior which remains labile, open to many meanings. Labile exterior and destabilised interior, I'm convinced I will see in that silverback surface not self but other, shimmering outline, ache, a throwing forwards and a simultaneous 
arching back. The performance of woman shattering. In my imaginary anatomy, woman is womb. My imaginary anatomy is supposed to be greater than the sum of its parts. Map, schema, organising principle laid over organ and bone and flesh. It should explain why, if I lose a limb, I might still feel it ghosting beneath a scarred and disconnected joint. So I wonder this. Is there a phantom organ syndrome? Is it only when we lose things we can see that the imaginary anatomy takes hold and insists on replacing the lack? If the phantom is a libidinal memorial to the lost limb, a nostalgic tribute strongly cathected in an attempt to undermine the perceptual awareness of its absence, then yes. Out of woman shattering, that shimmering outline, the slip into psychosis, comes a phantom womb. My ovaries once again have something to feed their eggs to. Ghosted cephalopod, it takes its place beneath the stitches and above the vault. It insinuates itself between my bladder and intestines. It unfurls its fallopian tube arms. It conveys wholeness and urges calm. I'm standing between the shower and the toilet. The tiles are warm under my stockinged toes. The skin on the back of my left hand rucks underneath the tape that holds the bung in place. My vision is still slightly blurred from anaesthetic, from coming so close to not alive, and I am convinced that when I look into the mirror I will see neither life nor death, but the haunting of the one by the other. I lift my eyes. My gestalt shimmers. I am doppelganger. I am less than the sum of my parts. The sense that any part of me is young bounces between corporeal space and phantasmic surface and then vanishes. In that moment, I enter middle age. In that moment, I feel my own death settle under my skin and I know that while I have always been haunted, now there is no escaping the fact of my own demise. Later, at home, lying gingerly on the brown couch, I will read Atwood's Negotiating with the Dead. When she says that writers are doubles twice times over, for the mere act of writing splits the self into two, I will feel a momentary shiver and recognise it for what it is. My doppelganger, shifting suddenly sideways in an attempt to avoid detection, split subjectivity, making a parodic attempt at wholeness for my sake alone, performing the farce that is self. Later, I will have trouble falling asleep, as if sleep itself were a tiny death, and I could not be sure of waking. Later, I will tremble as I stand before the void and try to take solace in leaving words on a page, in bringing myself back from the dead, piece by piece, dredging the self up, letter by letter. Because not just some, but all writing of the narrative kind, and perhaps all writing, is motivated deep down by a fear of and a fascination with mortality, by a desire to make the risky trip to the underworld and to bring something or someone back from the dead. Later, I will rescue myself with text, with the scribing of this lived body every day, with the knowledge that if I am read, I live. I knew when I walked into the operating theatre that I was losing a part of me, what I was unprepared for was the exact nature of that loss. Not tissue, nor muscle, nor blood, but invulnerability, immortality, a self that has no demise. In the mirror, in this moment, subjectivity is an unfixed thing. Am I infinitesimally psychotic? I am certainly unlocatable. Psychical interior shattered or at the very least disorganised and corporeal exterior punctured and stitched. The eye that is me shimmers in and out of being. It is as if I am looking at myself from corners, from above and at the same time see only space or the suggestion of form. I am momentarily Calois' version of a schizophrenic. I know where I am but I do not feel as though I am at the spot where I find myself. I am here and not here. I am unrecoverable. I use the drip pole to steady myself and pull off the compression stockings. I undo the straps of the hospital gown that is neither clean nor proper. It gapes and is stained with blood and urine and cellular seep. I turn on the taps and hold a hand under the water until the temperature is right. I step under still holding onto the pole as if that is the thing that will keep me here 
Water hits the top of my skull and I see it. Bird's eye view. Water runs over my bruised and sagging belly and I see that too from a place just behind the twining thread. Blood trickles and catches on the hairs that lace over my inner thighs. I am blurred but I stay there, warm, wet, holding my drip pole and reel myself back in. Tableau by tableau, here is my knee that is strong, that bends slightly when I move to find soap. Here is the scar on my right upper arm that rests under its tattooed hiding place. Those are my fingers forming a fist. These are my breasts, emptied of fat and milk, resting softly on the cage of my chest. Gestalt, imaginary anatomy, schema, self, reordered by senses, by perception, by the way that water traces form. I am reeled back in. I situate myself inside myself. The anaesthetic fuzz leaves. I understand that I am not whole. I work at acceptance. Ruptures are where I find strength and relief and even love. Thanks very much. So if you'd like a copy of my paper, I'm happy to send it to you.